Uh, thanks everyone for coming and thank you, uh, Demetrius, for the very uh, gracious introduction. I hope I don't disappoint. Um, uh, yeah, so my talk today, um, yeah, was originally titled Bayesian Learning and Uncertainty Quantification. And after I made the presentation, I think it's a bit better to be titled Uncertainty Quantification for Predictive Models. So I'm going to talk about Bayesian learning and some frequentist methodologies, uh, fair share of both the uh, paradigms. Um, so let's start simple. Let's just think of classification. And for, throughout this talk, I'll be talking about uh, classification uh, almost exclusively. Um, imagine we have a feature vector x. It goes into some function uh, f of x. That's a classifier. And out comes our prediction uh, y hat. And um, due to all the excitement in machine learning and AI these days, and probably why most of you are here, right, we want to apply these uh, great and exciting methodologies to impactful problems, uh, such as healthcare. This is an uh, application I'm interested in. And right, maybe we have uh, our uh, features are some sort of health measurements, and our prediction is some sort of diagnosis. And so you know, imagine deploying such a system, you train it up in your lab, uh, you uh, try it out on test data, it does really well, has high accuracy, and now you're ready to deploy it to the real world and to your local hospital. And you know, it sees its first patient and it makes a diagnosis. Um, you're ready to treat the patient, but I'm sure at some step along this process, uh, you know, a real doctor or a real person in charge will say, uh, you know, wait a minute, kind of how can we trust this model? How certain is this model? Um, you know, I, I can't just like let it make diagnoses about patients without knowing its, its reliability. And so you can't just give the uh, doctor or this person uh, who's kind of making these safety checks um, just a prediction, right? You can't say, okay, this person has pneumonia, right? You have to say something more. And this talk is about that, right? We want to say something more than just a prediction, right? So for instance, maybe we want to give a probability or a confidence statement and say, okay, the model thinks that, and the model is 80% confident that this person um, has pneumonia. Right, that's a lot more information that the doctors say, okay, yeah, I think this person has pneumonia too. The model agrees, like, let's give the treatment for pneumonia. Um, and we'll also be talking about confidence sets. So instead of just maybe a, a, a one probability associated with the prediction, we can say something like, okay, well, here's a set, a set of labels uh, C of X. And I think that the probability of the true label is in this set at C of X is greater uh, than 95%. Right, so maybe uh, that we say that the model is 95% confident that the patient has pneumonia, tuberculosis, uh, or asthma. And then the doctor or whoever says, okay, yeah, I think these three options are good. Let's do a further test to narrow it down further. Yeah, so this talk is going to be about constructing these things for predictive models, and especially black box predictive models like neural networks. Um, and so, yeah, the, the goal of the talk is uh, to have some sense afterward of how to know what your model doesn't know. Okay, so let's first start off with a bit of a philosophical question. Um, what is uncertainty? It seems like the thing maybe we need to define before giving algorithms and methodologies to, to find it out. And there are two types of uncertainty. They have kind of scary names, but they're not that scary when you uh, think about them. So the first is uh, called aleatoric. And you can think of this as fundamental uncertainty and it's related to the Bayes error rate. Um, it's, uh, I'll show an example in a minute, but it's basically uncertainty that's irreducible even when under uh, collecting more data. The only way you can get around it is possibly to collect more features. And so I'll give an example now. So imagine we have just a very simple classification task, two classes, uh, one in green, one in red, and we want to train some classifier like a neural network to separate these two classes, right? And so I did that and, and there's the decision boundary. Um, the region of high aleatoric uncertainty is in the yellow box here. And it's hard to see from the uh, screen here, but the reason this is high aleatoric uncertainty is because there's fundamental overlap in the distributions, right? We see some red points are clearly in, deep into the section of green points. And uh, conversely, there are green points that are deep into the section of red points. Right? So there'll always be some uh, amount of error that if you make a prediction in there, uh, because the distributions are so close together, you might get it wrong. And maybe I'll give a more intuitive example from self-driving. So imagine you have a self-driving car and you train it in an urban environment, right? Like uh, Athens, say. And a task that has 
uh, high aleatoric uncertainty is uh, avoiding a head-on collision. So right, imagine you know, the self-driving car is driving along and there's a car heading right towards it. Right? What should that car do? Should it swerve left? Should it swerve right? Should it stop? Should it continue straight, assuming the other person is going to swerve left or right? right? There's just a lot of fundamental uncertainty and you will get the decision wrong and there will be a crash right, some percentage of the time. And maybe we could reduce this uncertainty if we could collect more features. So right, if I had some sort of brain scan of the other person driving and knew, OK, they were going to turn left because that's what their brain was telling them to do in the moment, right? this would be another feature that reduces the uncertainty there because, OK, their brain's going to tell them to turn left. I, I will turn the other way. right? But of course, collecting that feature is you know, near impossible. right? Um, OK, so that was fundamental uncertainty. The next is called epistemic. And epistemic is uh, uh, a bit easier to deal with because it's just due to lack of experience or lack of observations. And this is, I think, more the more intuitive definition of uncertainty. Like, you know, if you ask me how to play the piano, I've never played the piano before, so I have a lot of uncertainty about how to play the piano. But, but I can easily reduce that uncertainty by practicing. Right? And this is what this type of uncertainty is. If you collect more data, this uncertainty will go down. And so let's uh, go back to this uh, example we had before of these two classes. Uh, the region of high epistemic uncertainty is in the boundary points here, right? This area where there's no data, uh, right here, right here. Um, and the reason this is is because basically the classifier has put its decision boundary out there, but it wasn't guided by anything. It wasn't guided by data at all. Right, there's no data out there to say, okay, you should move the line a little bit to the left or a little bit to the right. It just picks somewhere because of um, the quirk of optimization of whatever local minima it found. Right, and so if you retrain this model just with a different random seed, you get a different, slightly different decision boundary. And so that's what I'm showing here, right? So the original time I ran it was right here, but now it's slightly to the left. And I can rerun it again with a different random seed and I get a slightly different solution. And I can rerun it again with a slightly different random seed, and I get a different solution. Um, so uh, this is the sign that there's high epistemic uncertainty because there's no data to guide where the model's going. Notice, conversely, though, at the region of high aleatoric uncertainty, right? All the models are kind of uh, agreeing there. Uh, this place right in the middle, because it is strongly guided by data, and the uncertainty is due to again this fundamental error. Going back to our autonomous driving example, an example of high epistemic uncertainty would be if the uh, you wanted to drive the car that was trained in the city into the mountains, right? You want to take a trip to Switzerland and drive in the Alps. The model is going to have a lot of epistemic uncertainty there because it's never driven in the mountains before. Uh, but of course, you can reduce that uncertainty by just simply collecting more data, training data in the mountains, right? It's, you kind of uh, know if you collect data, it will get better at it. But note that we haven't reduced the aleatoric uncertainty because you can still have a head-on collision in the mountains, right? You will, if you see another car coming down the mountain road right at you, we will still have this fundamental uncertainty about what to do. Okay, so in practice, it's very important to distinguish these types of uncertainty, uh, or at least think about them. But unfortunately, um, a lot of the methodologies we have have a really hard time distinguishing kind of under a finite data set, what is the source of uncertainty? Is it aleatoric? Is it epistemic? So for the rest of this talk, I'm basically going to ignore this distinction, unfortunately. Um, but this is um, yeah, a, a generally a hard problem that we could have yeah, at least two hours of lecture on itself. And so I'll say uncertainty is high when either of these types of uncertainty are high. Okay, so that was uh, what is uncertainty. Let's now talk about modeling paradigms. And there's two fundamental paradigms you've probably heard about before. Oh, sorry. I will first talk about some assumptions uh, that we'll set up uh, that will apply to all of the modeling paradigms. Uh, so the first one is we'll assume that uh, our data sets are coming from some underlying fixed distribution. I'll call it P double bar. So it's a classification task. Why are the labels X for the features? So we have some, some fixed underlying distribution that we don't know about, and that's what generated our data. And we only see samples from this underlying distribution. So we see a training data set uh, D with N samples in it. And our goal is to fit a model to uncover this ground truth, right? We have some model, uh, 
p of y given x, we want to fit this to approximate this p double bar uh, y given x. Right, this is just the task of predictive modeling in a nutshell. And so there are two fundamental paradigms when uh, addressing this problem. You probably have seen it in your statistics courses if you have one before, frequentism and Bayesianism. And there's a lot of philosophical debate between these two and you could, you know, we could have a whole series of courses or uh, lecture series on just what are the differences between them. But I think an intuitive separation is simply where the randomness comes from. So in frequentism, you assume the randomness comes from the data sampling distribution. Right, so we, when we sample from that underlying generative process, there'll be some noise there, and that's where the randomness and, and therefore our uncertainty comes from. And the, home, and the way you learn under the frequentist paradigm is simply maximum likelihood estimation. So we define some model that I showed before, P of Y given X, and now I'll define some parameters theta. And under maximum likelihood learning, you simply take the log probability under, under all the data points, and you take the sum and then you maximize it to find the uh, parameter setting that maximizes this log likelihood function. And even if you haven't called it this, you do this all the time. If you just train with the, uh, to minimize the cross entropy loss, that can be written as a maximum likelihood estimation, right? So you're, you're doing this already if you didn't do it, uh, if you didn't know. And if we assume that process works perfectly, right? We have a really big data set and a very kind of nicely behaved model uh, you can get uncertainty from it just simply by reading the probability estimates out from the model and treating them as the true underlying probabilities, right? So we can just say that, okay, hopefully lear learning worked really well, assume it's near perfect, and we can just read off the probabilities and say, okay, if my model gives probability 0.5 to a class, this is the true underlying probability. Right, so uncertainty quantification here is basically trivial. You just read out your softmax output. So if you have a classification model and you have the softmax output layer, um, you can just say, okay, if it says uh, 0.5 uh, output for class four, that is my prediction. And I say a 50% confidence that it's this class. Uh, likewise, if you want to construct a confidence uh, set for your top ranked outputs, you simply look at your top ranked classes and say, if I want to construct a 95% confidence set, I simply take off the classes in descending order until I reach 95%, right? So I would, in this case, I would take the 0.5 class, the 0.3 class, and the 0.15 class, right? And that sums up to 95%. Right, just kind of super naive and super simple and the first thing you would think to do. Um, however, as you may have found out yourself, this doesn't work, right? We can't actually rely on these probability estimates as the true underlying probabilities. And so um, it's a bit hard to see here, but uh, a nice example from a 2017 paper is uh, they took the CIFAR, uh, 100 data set, and they trained two neural networks, uh, a, a Lynette from 1996 and a ResNet from 2016, with the, with the ResNet, of course, being much, much bigger, much more powerful model. And they looked at the percentage of samples on the y-axis um, and on the x-axis is their softmax output. So the uh, histogram of all of the softmax outputs you see for the top ranked class. And in the previous model, uh, the older model, you see it's fairly um, evenly distributed in its confidences, right? We see confidences ranging from, you know, 0.2 to 1. And if we average those confidences, it roughly approximates the accuracy we see on the data set, right? So this model got around 50% accuracy. And if you average the top softmax outputs, they're about 50%. Uh, the resident, on the other hand, is in some ways a better predictive model, right? Because see, it got about 70% accuracy. So, you know, if you were going to pick between the two models, you would pick that one because it has higher accuracy, but it's much more confident, right? So we see a lot of the softmax outputs are near one. And if you average, uh, average over all the softmax outputs, you see that the average value or the average confidence is actually much higher than the accuracy, right? So this tells you that you couldn't just read off the softmax outputs because you would getting uh, an over, overconfident estimate of how good you'll actually be. And so we can't just use this naive frequentist paradigm to do uncertainty quantification. Okay, so then there's another paradigm called Bayesianism. And Bayesianism assumes the randomness comes from the prior distribution over parameters. And so I assume you've seen uh, some Bayesian learning earlier this week when you saw you know, VAEs, for instance. But I'll go over it very quickly. Um, 
uh, Bayesian learning uh, simply starts by first defining a prior. And this prior is where the kind of the secret sauce happens. Uh, you can define this in a way that perhaps jumpstarts your learning. So if you know already okay, good solutions are in this regime, or I expect models to take on, good models to take on the following form, you can build that into your prior distribution. And so that will constrain your parameters uh, to certain solutions you think are good a priori. Uh, then you multiply that distribution by your likelihood. This is the same term we had before. And then you divide it by a normalizing constant that I'll define in the next slide. And this gives you your posterior probability, right? So it's how your beliefs that were coded by your prior, how they've updated now that you've seen some data. And this normalizing constant is the hard thing uh, that why makes Bayesian lear learning uh, difficult at times. And what you have to do to compute it is after you take the likelihood times the prior and integrate over all possible parameter settings. So you can already imagine that for a neural network, this is going to be very hard to compute because we have you know, millions, if not now billions of weights. And we have to do this integral, high dimensional integral over all of these different configurations. Um, but assuming you can do that, you can do uh, a predictive distribution as follows. For some new data point uh, X tilde, you can take your likelihood with that data point plugged in, P of Y given X, tilde, multiply by your posterior distribution and integrate out over all the parameters. And this gives you something called the posterior predictive distribution. And this is what you'd learn, use to make predictions in the Bayesian framework. All right, so it's any, all of the kind of uh, uncertainty or um, hedging that your model does over different models in the posterior, you sum over all of them and that is how you generate your predictions. And you can use this uh, distribution, assuming learning goes well, um, just as you, we did before, we can just use it as an estimate of the ground truth. And so if you want to you know, report confidence scores, you can just look at your posterior predictive distribution and you know, report the top ranked class and say, I have 50% confidence that this will work, or this is the true class. Uh, but unfortunately, Bayesian learning has its own limitations and they're mainly computational. So integrating all over all these possible parameter settings is extremely difficult even for simple models. And so it's difficult to even approximate these, these posterior distributions and posterior predictive distributions for neural networks, right? Evaluating the marginal likelihood is hard and computing the posterior predictive distribution is hard. And so just a quick and uh, you know, dirty summary, uh, frequentism is nice because it's fully data driven and has sort of easy computation, but you're often misled by sampling noise and your data set not being big enough. Uh, Bayesianism, on the other hand, has this nice prior distribution that can jumpstart and constrain bad solutions during the learning, but it has the downside that computation is usually very costly. And so the way I think about these differences is frequentism is like your kind of basic like table knife, butter knife. It gets the job done in a lot of cases, but it's clearly limited. Bayesianism is like your Swiss army knife where it just is doing maybe too much at times, right? You don't want to carry this thing in your pocket because it's uh, too cumbersome. So making these methods more practical and able to work robustly in practice will require maybe beefing up the frequentist solution and kind of approximating and, and making the Bayesian solution a little bit more lightweight. Okay, so now I will talk about the main part of the talk, where I will talk about practical methods for uncertainty quantification uh, in these two paradigms. And this is a very biased selection, of course, due to the you know, only one hour lecture. But everything i have uh, presenting here, even if it seems complicated at times on the slides, it's really easy to implement. And um, uh, I hope this will uh, uh, allow uh, you to take these solutions back home with you. Okay, so I'll be presenting four things. Uh, for frequentism, something called bootstrap aggregation or bagging, uh, and also something called conformal prediction. For Bayesianism, I'll talk about sample then optimize ensembling and variational inference with Laplace approximations. So frequentism, uh, bootstrap aggregation or bagging works like this. Um, so recall that frequentism assumes that the randomness is coming from the data sampling process. And so one way to kind of uh, uh, get a handle on that randomness and therefore build uncertainty in our model is to know where that noise is coming from. Uh, 
And so ideally we could just, if we just saw additional data or additional data sets, right, from our model, everything would be fine, right? If I could just draw more data sets, uh, uh, this, this uncertainty would go down. Uh, but of course we can't do this, right? We kind of stuck with our fixed training set it, uh, most of the time. And so the idea of bootstrapping gets around this uh, problem by simply saying, okay, I'm going to treat my data set that I've seen, my training data, as a source of generating new data sets. So this looks like some complicated math, but it's just a very simple way of writing sampling without replacement. So I take my existing data set, and then with uh, equal probability, I will draw a new uh, data point from that set, put it into a new data set, and draw it n times, and then repeat that operation k total times for k new data sets. So now I've taken my one data set, resampled how often things are occurring in it, and created k new data sets. And so we can think of this process visually as follows. We have our original data set, uh, D here. I can resample it, uh, again, just drawing with replacement from this original data set to construct K new data sets. And so once I've done that, I can just do regular maximum likelihood learning, where I uh, uh, do maximum likelihood learning on each data set individually. And so I get K new parameter estimates. And now I can uh, combine those in, into an ensemble by just summing together all these different models. And so now this bagging ensemble, we'll call it, should be a much better way to quantify uncertainty um, in, in the modeling process, uh, better than just training on one fixed data set, because we've tried to replicate the sampling noise process. And so if you want to learn more about these techniques, um, some further reading is this uh, a classic textbook by uh, Bradley Efron, uh, an introduction to the bootstrap. Okay, so that was uh, technique number one. Technique number two uh, will go to the Bayesian camp and something called uh, sample and optimize ensembling. Again, the name sounds quite long, but really it's going to be very related to this bootstrap aggregation process. So recall that Bayesianism, its randomness comes from sampling from the prior. And so this method is going to do something very similar to bootstrap aggregation, but instead of sampling new data sets, we're going to sample draws from the prior and do maximum likelihood learning on them. And this seems like quite far from the Bayesian process, you might think, but there's actually work that shows that this procedure very nearly covers the true posterior distribution in, in, in some simple cases. And so the same diagram as follows. Now we start with the prior. Again, this is our starting point for uncertainty quantification. We draw samples from the prior, say K samples, theta bar here. And we will use this as our initialization of our neural network or whatever model we're using during our training process. So we initialize our neural network with these K samples. Then we do maximum likelihood learning to get the uh, K parameter estimates. And we can ensemble them into a, some sort of approximate predictive distribution, just like we did before. And this is actually what I did in this uh, previous uh, figure I showed you, where we I refit the um, uh, the neural network on this simple data set. Um, I basically just reinitialized the uh, parameters, and here the prior was whatever initialization scheme scikit learning was using underneath. But if we think of that as the prior, um, I did you know four draws from it, and then optimized each individually. Uh, yeah. Just a, a few clarification questions. So uh, about the last slide, uh, if the model is not an Ilan network but is linear, the maximum likelihood has an analytical solution. So the prior doesn't affect at any point. Uh, so it's it's all about I initialize and then I do create in the set, or or, or am I misunderstanding? Sorry. Yeah. So the, there's uh, some more details here than. Uh, you're correct. You're definitely right in that uh, if you just do gradient, if you do a exact solution, you will get the same value for all the parameters here. I believe this is conditions under gradient descent. So this uh, Matthews et al. paper I refer to has the um, sorry the conditions for linear models that you need to to not just get the same solution over okay, and over. Thank you. And 
but yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, if you, you just use the least squares estimator, you get the same parameter for everything. Yeah, I think so the paper for linear models was really inspired by the fact that people were doing this for neural networks because we couldn't compute anything close to a posterior or anything. And then it was like the case of theory following the uh, experiments where people said, okay, actually, is this a principal thing to do? And they analyzed it for some linear models. They, oh, actually, you can kind of set up a linear model where this makes sense uh, as well. So um, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. And uh, And so here's, here's what I did for this uh, simple classification problem. And you can see that um, just simply due to these random reinitializations, um, we're getting some uncertainty bars now in these uh, more extreme regions that are capturing the epistemic uncertainty. And uh, yeah, similar to the question, you might think, okay, this seems like a very naive process. Does this actually do what we want it to do? Does this actually approximate a Bayesian procedure? And the kind of empirical evidence uh, for this is this nice paper by uh, Ismailov et al, uh, ICMO 2021, where they did the kind of uh, most computational, computationally intensive Bayesian inference to date on big neural networks so like ResNets. And they computed what's called the HMC solution, which is like as gold standard as you could get. They did it on 512 TPUs. Uh, and they compared this to some other things like don't worry about this side of the slide, but the second, um, the second column is just doing regular stochastic gradient descent. And the third column is doing this deep ensemble technique or this sample then optimized technique I just described. And one, if we look at the accuracy, the gold standard method gets 89 and the deep ensembles get 88. And if we look at something called the agreement, which is basically how similar these models are. So high agreement means that we've captured something as close as we can get to the Bayes gold standard solution we see that the SGD solution only has 85% agreement, whereas the deep ensemble has 91% agreement, very close to the gold standard of 94. Um, so just doing this very simple procedure uh, is, yeah, just a surprisingly good approximation for, for true Bayesian inference. And just to summarize, summarize this difference between the uh, Bayesian and frequentist uh, methodologies in this in this one framework I presented, right? They both have the following uh, last two steps, right? We do maximum likelihood and we combine the models just with a simple average. Uh, the, the real difference is in these first steps of where the uncertainty comes from, right? Do you start with the prior and sample from that? Or you start with the data set and sample and resample it? And so for some further reading, uh, I'll give two example papers. Um, one is simple and scalable predictive uncertainty uh, estimation using deep ensembles. And this is the paper that first showed that deep neural networks are surprisingly good at uncertainty quantification if you do this simple procedure. And the second paper is the paper I just mentioned the result from. Um, it's what are, what are Bayesian neural network posteriors really like? Okay, so now I'll talk about the third methodology, uh, go back to frequentism, something that's quite different than what I just described, something called conformal prediction. This is something that's really come to prominence the last few years, like it's a really much more proper, popular uh, technique. And so the aim of conformal prediction is to uh, construct uncertainty sets over the labels with uh, guaranteed validity. And so here's an example I took from a paper, uh, it's hard to see, but Imagine you put into your classifier um, this example, this picture of a squirrel. And this is a very clean picture of a squirrel. And so we hope our model would be very confident in getting the label right. And so it says it's a fox squirrel with 99% confidence. And our label set only has one element in it, and it's this fox squirrel. But imagine if we gave the same classifier the second images, which is, which is also a squirrel, but it's a bit harder to see, right? The squirrel is kind of behind a tree a little bit. Uh, this one, we're a bit more uncertain about what it is, and so it gives a confidence set of four different labels, fox squirrel, gray fox, uh, bucket, and rain barrel, because there's a feeding bucket in it. And so we see that due to the lower quality of the image, the uncertainty set gets a bit larger. And lastly, uh, this picture of a squirrel that's really bad quality because it's cut off on the side. Um, this one is harder still, and it's apparently its ground truth label is still fox squirrel, but the model thinks it's a, a marmot with even higher probability. 
And so the uncertainty here uh, is much, much larger. And so there's one, two, three, four, five, six, six elements in the uncertainty set to reflect that the image has a lot more, um, uh, you know, uh, harder, it's a lot more harder to make the correct classification decision. And so the goal of conformal inference then is to construct some set, uh, call it C of X, such that the true label is in that set with some probability. So one minus alpha, say alpha is 0.5, sorry, 0 0.05, so one minus alpha is 95%. So we want the true label to be in this set with 95% confidence. Um, and again, right, because of these failures of, of usually doing just the naive frequent disturbation thing, we can't just read off our softmax outputs and know that, uh, and, and construct the 95% confidence sent that way and know it's, it's valid, right? This is often not valid. And so this is a procedure to adapt the threshold at which you stop adding points to your sets. And so uh, if you read these papers, they go a lot into the theory of why this is statistically valid. Um, I would just say it's based on something called exchangeability. Exchangeability is a slightly weaker assumption than, than uh, independently and identically distributed. It just means that the order you see your data points doesn't really matter. Your data points could come in a different order and their joint distribution would be the same. And this is the kind of core underlying theoretical principle this technique is going to use. and says that, okay, I see some training data. I assume that it could have equally be, been exchanged with my test data and, and the probability still would have stayed the, stayed the same or invariant under this permutation process. So that's um, kind of a very quick gesture at the underlying theory. Um, but I'll just go on down to describe the algorithm what we do in the, in the actual algorithm of conformal prediction. And so say we've trained a model uh, using right, whatever you like, frequentist or Bayesian inference. And now we have the, we can read out the underlying probabilities. We can read out the probabilities from the model, but we can't treat them as the underlying probabilities, right? So we can say P Y equals one given X, this will be some number, but we can't treat it as the true underlying probability. This is our starting point. And so the first thing we do is for every point in some held out validation set, we sort the model probabilities in decreasing order. And so say class two is ranked first, class one is ranked second, class three is ranked third. And then we will sum these probabilities in decreasing order until the true class is included. And we know the true class because it's our validation set. And so say uh, squirrel is the true class, and so we will construct a score S of X that takes the softmax output for class two and the softmax output for class one and sums them together. And we will do this for every point in our validation set. And so we will get an empirical distribution of these S of X scores. So we get some histogram where we have uh, the S of X scores uh, on the X axis and the counts on the Y axis. And we will compute the one minus alpha empirical quantile of this, meaning that basically 95% or whatever quantile you pick, 95, 99, whatever, 90 some percent of the scores will fall to the left of that quantile. And then we're going to use this quantile as our threshold at test time when we don't know the true label. And so instead of just stopping at 95% in our softmax upwards, we're going to stop when we cross this empirical quantile. Okay, so now at test time, we see a new data point. We're going to start just as before. We rank it, we rank the model probabilities. And so say now that class three is uh, highest, then class two, then class one. Then we'll construct the set by adding them in decreasing order. And after we, we've added one, we'll check if the sum of the prob model probabilities goes over uh, this quantile that we've computed on the validation set. And so say we add the Fox class, and then we check is the uh, probability of the softmax under the Fox class, is, is it uh, greater than the quantile? Let's say no. So we continue the process. And now we add the marmot and we check if the sum of the two probabilities is greater and it is, and so we stop. And so this would be our final conformal uh, prediction set for this particular data point, right? You include two classes, uh, y equals three and y equals two. Uh, 
And if you do this process, the true label is guaranteed to be in this set one minus alpha percent of the time on average over the test set. So this is a weaker condition because we have this strong validity assumption, uh, uh, assumption or guarantee that the true label will be in this set with some probability. We've had to kind of weaken it a bit and say, okay, I can't tell you for a given data point. Like if you give me one single data point, one single patient, and I give you a conformal set of the, of the uh, diseases this patient might have, I can't tell you 95% probability that the true disease is in that set. Only on average over a bunch of patients will the true label be in this set. That's level, uh, that error level of the time. So this is only good when you, you know, if you, if you want to make, uh, do uncertainty quantification on a per data point basis, this is not that good because it's only guaranteed to hold over a bunch of data points. But no, this is still a much stronger guarantee than you would get by just training a model and looking at the softmax scores, right? You have no guarantee there. Yeah, and so there's a great resource written by um, uh, some two people, um, uh, Angelopoulos and Stephen Bates. Um, it's called A Gentle Introduction to Conformal Prediction and Distribution-Free Uncertainty Quantification. Uh, definitely check that out if you're uh, interested in uh, reading more. Okay, so the last method I'll talk about is variational inference with the Laplace approximation. And this is a Bayesian technique. And so I assume you've seen variational inference already in some form since you saw variational autoencoders and um, yeah, maybe it was covered in diffusion models as well. Um, but the idea here is that if you have an intractable posterior distribution, um, you fit a simple distribution to it as an approximation. And so in the case here, the purple distribution is the true posterior say, and you know, just say we can't actually compute it, but rather compute some approximation Q theta that hopefully captures the areas of high probability density uh, under the true distribution, but doesn't capture it entirely. And so there are many ways to do this, right? You probably heard about variational Bayes or you know, Bayes by backprop. I'm going to talk about a technique that is quite old, but also has, has had some recent resurgence as a very kind of scalable and very um, practical way to uh, compute uncertainty estimates. And so imagine we have this optimization surface. This optimization surface is the uh, sum of the negative log probability under the likelihood and the log prior, right? So we can think of this as surfaces proportional to the posterior. And imagine if we ran gradient descent on this surface, we don't. Uh, we can find a local mode where I've indicated here with the red arrow, right? So hopefully gradient descent finds that local mode. And where a regular kind of frequentist point estimate estimation would just stop there, the plus approximation says, okay, I can't compute the full posterior, right? I can't integrate uh, my, my distribution over all this possible space, but rather I'm just going to construct a very local distribution around this point estimate I found. All right, so we're just going to quantify the uncertainty captured in this very local region of parameter space. And so the plus approximation is as follows. Um, you uh, say the true posterior is approximated by a normal distribution where the mean is this point estimate. We'll call it a map estimate. That's how it's usually defined as, a, as the true maximum of the variational distribution. Uh, but really for neural networks and other complicated models that have multiple uh, local maxima, it's going to be some good maxima we found using gradient descent. And so that will be the mean of this normal distribution. And its variance will be something called the inverse Hessian matrix. And the Hessian matrix is simply, we take this, um, uh, the numerator of Bayes' rule, the likelihood and the prior, take the law, the negative log, and we take the matrix of second derivatives computed over the training set. All right, so this is a huge uh, matrix that's, that has the number of rows and columns that are equal to the number of parameters in the neural network. And so, you know, we didn't truly get a scalable solution because this matrix is really, really big, right? If you did this for, you know, a big language model, this would be, <laughs> billions by billions of parameters, right? So you often need to kind of assume something here, maybe a diagonal approximation or maybe a, a low rank structure to this, but it is computable on a, on a wide variety of neural networks. 
And so to get some intuition for why this is the right thing to do, let's think of just the one dimensional example of the same optimization surface. Um, it's hard to see, but there's a purple line here that captures the optimization surface. Right, right here. And so imagine we find a point estimate or, or just our point estimate lands in one of the valleys on this optimization surface. Computing this Hessian matrix will capture the curvature in that region. Right? So in this case where the valley is sort of broad, this is an area of small curvature. And therefore, when we take the inverse in the approximation, we have large posterior variance. Conversely, if we would have landed here in this more narrower uh, local optima, we would have had large, cur large curvature and so when you take the inverse Hessian, it's a small posterior variant. So it's saying, OK, don't let my parameters wiggle much because I don't have much room to wiggle or I'll leave that valley. Yeah, and that's basically it. Um, you just uh, you just have to train your neural network with stochastic gradient descent. And then it just uh, just one extra call to your auto differentiation functions to compute this Hessian. And now you have a posterior approximation that captures the local structure of your mode. And so now when you want to compute a predictive distribution, uh, you just use your posterior approximation. Right? So you just plug that in for your regular posterior. And this can be an approximation to the true predictive distribution that you wanted. Um, note for something like neural networks, even this integral is still hard to compute. But, you, but how you get around it is just use just sample from this normal approximation. And then you use a, a sampling based approximation of this integral. Um, but very simple to do. You can take a pre-trained model off the internet, uh, compute this Hessian matrix, and now you have a, a Bayesian solution basically and in, in, in without extra training. Yeah, and then you might notice, okay, if, you're, if you uh, thought back to the earlier techniques we talked about, well, you say, okay, well, maybe, um, yeah, we found this local mode, but maybe there's two local, there are local optima here. Shouldn't we try to quantify uncertainty by like hedging over both of those models? And so, yeah, you can actually do um, uh, multiple loss approximations using different random initializations of your training process. And so this gives you a procedure that's like a sample then optimize Laplace approximation where you draw from your prior multiple times. Then those samples from your prior, you can optimize somehow, maybe maximum likelihood, maybe uh, using your prior to regularize. Then you get some final point estimates and you compute your Hessian matrices around all of these k point estimates. All right, so this is taking the Laplace approximation and integrating it with this previous technique I showed. And so now we have a mixture approximation to the posterior that's going to kind of hedge our uncertainty over these multiple optima. OK, so for some further reading in this, um, I recommend the recent paper uh, Laplace Redux by uh, Daxberger et al. And with this package, they have a, with this paper, they have a very nice GitHub package called Laplace. And it makes applying these techniques super simple uh, uh, to your pre-trained models. And so definitely check that out. So. OK, so, so that was our uh, four techniques for uh, uncertainty quantification. Like I said, this was a very biased selection, but I've tried to uh, give you things that are fairly easy to implement and uh, something to take home with you and try right away. And so just some summary here. For frequentism, we often need to do something more than maximum likelihood. And this often looks like having extra data, whether it's synthesized from original training set or it's using some held out data to compute some extra quantities there, right? Like, so even something simple as like, uh, validating your your hyperparameters on a validation set, you can kind of see as as in this uh, frequentist uh, uncertainty quantification paradigm. And for Bayesianism, we often need to do a bit less than the procedure describes, right? We can't do the full base solution, so we need to do something a bit more lightweight computationally. And this often takes the form of constructing approximations that are localized to areas of high posterior density. And I should also note before moving on from this is that you can mix these procedures, right? So something like data augmentation, right? Where you have a training set and say, we often like for images, but we'll apply different transformations to them like rotations or cropping or different scaling techniques. Um, that's sort of a Bayesian prior, right? I'm saying, okay, I think my solutions 
are going to be good under ones that are like invariant to a bit of rotation in my images, you're sort of have an implicit prior there. And so I see if something like doing um, data augmentation, but applying your sort of user defined transformations to that is a hybrid uh, procedure where you're doing something frequentist and something Bayesian at the same time. Um, you could also, as I already mentioned, you could apply this conformal prediction technique to your posterior predictive distribution, right? So I can use my Laplace technique to get a posterior predictive distribution, and then I can apply conformal inference on top of that to maybe have a better calibrated uh, um, uh, uh, confidence set, right? And there you're mixing paradigms as well, right? I use Bayesianism to get my predictive distribution, but I'm going to use a kind of frequentist correction on top of it. Okay, I'll briefly now talk about evaluating uncertainty quantification. So, right, so now you've used one of these techniques, you've applied it to the data set that you care about. How do you know that it worked? And so there are two um, very often used techniques for evaluating uncertainty quantification. One is called calibration. That is, can the model forecast its own performance? And one is called coverage, right? Does the model meet the given error level? And so calibration, uh, you probably sort of thought about already, or maybe implicitly thought about it, when you look at a weather forecast, right? So this is um, some weather forecast, and right, this is the weather app, and you see that you know it says on a particular day, it might say, okay, it rains or, or thunderstorms with 60% chance or 50% chance. What does this probability actually mean, right? Like, does it mean if I reran that day multiple times, it would rain on 60% of them? Does it mean something else? I'm, I'm not sure. But one way you can empirically check that your weather forecaster is good is simply to say, OK, all the times that they predicted 60% something will happen, if I look at all those days, did in out of six out of 10 days, did that thing happen? Right. So if the weather forecaster says it will um, you know, be rainy 60 uh, with 60% chance, I look back at the historical times that they said that, and did it rain six out of 10 times on average, right? 60% empirical frequency. Right, so this is one way you can use historical data to check if when the forecaster says a given probability, does that reflect the actual accuracy of the forecast? Right, and so we can measure this for our models with something called a reliability diagram, where we look at the empirical accuracy on the y-axis and the confidence score, so usually the softmax output on the x-axis. And so we're using the same technique that I described before, where you take all the times a model said roughly 70% uh, confidence of a class, and was it? And you then you look in your data set and say, was it correct 70% of the time? Right? Was it if there were 10 cases where it said 70%, was it correct seven out of 10 times? And so when you plot this, you get something like this, where you have uh, some out your outputs uh, of the actual empirical accuracies uh, versus uh, you want to look at how they compare to the perfectly diagonal line. And so perfect calibration is when these blue bars are exactly on the diagonal, because that means when the model said it was 60% confident, it got 60% accuracy on those examples. And when you're off this line, it can mean two things. If you're above this line, it means underconfident, right? Because my confidence scores are actually lower than my empirical accuracy, right? So if the model says it got it's 20% confident, but it's actually getting those cases right like 90% of the time, right? It's underconfident. Conversely, it can be overconfident, and that's the model we show here in the blue bars, um, because the empirical accuracies are a bit below the uh, reported confidence levels by the model. And so this is actually a reliability diagram for that ResNet model I showed earlier in the talk, where right we see in the histogram on the right, there's a lot of uh, softmax outputs that are near one. And that's causing this overconfidence because right that's making the, uh, the blue bars drift below the uh, y equals x line, the diagonal line in the reliability diagram. So some good reading on this. Um, I took these figures from a paper called On Calibration of Modern Neural Networks. That's a good paper to read. And there's a more theoretical, but a paper that really helped my thinking called Evaluating Model Calibration and Classification 
uh, from some people from Uppsala uh, University in, in Sweden. Um, and so lastly is coverage. Coverage is, is a much more simple to explain. It's basically if you construct confidence sets, what on, on the test set, what fraction of the time does the true label fall in that confidence set? And so this is just a simple uh, mathematical expression that says, okay, the sum over an M size test set, capital N size test set, do I check as an indicator function if the true label is in that, in that uh, confidence set or not? And if it is, the numerator will be one. If it's not, it will be zero. And I'll compute the fraction of times that happens over the test set. And is that greater than one minus alpha, right? Which is our target uh, error level. So if I say one minus alpha is 95%, I want the true label to be in the, for the test set to be in my confidence set 95% of the time. And so I should note that conformal inference by construction, conformal prediction by construction will give you this guarantee automatically, right? So it will guarantee to, to hold. Uh, um, but there's one catch, right? So I can give you uh, a perfect uh, confidence set by just returning all the labels, right? So if I just return all possible labels, right, that is guaranteed to cover the true label, right, by the trivial solution. And so we often look at the size of these sets to make sure they're efficient, right? You don't want to be returning overly high sets. So, right, so conformal inference is guaranteed to give you sets that meet the desired coverage threshold, but it doesn't control the size of the sets, right? So you might have a really bad model and you apply conformal prediction to it, you might get really bad uncertainty sets in this form that they're just really, really large. And so it doesn't help that if a doctor wants uh, the uncertainty set for a patient's prediction and you return, you know, a thousand or 2000 different diseases, right? That's not very helpful to the doctor, right? They want kind of a small set of maybe 10 or less diseases, right? Okay, yeah, so those were the two evaluation techniques that you should check out if you're applying these techniques. And so, yeah, I'll just wrap up with a quick summary. So I talked about types of uncertainty, epistemic and aleatoric, right? Aleatoric is fundamental uncertainty. Epistemic uncertainty can be reduced by collecting more data. I talked about modeling paradigms, uh, frequentism where you assume that the randomness comes from the data, Bayesianism where you assume the randomness comes from the parameters. I talked about some practical methods that you should uh, use to correct for the faults and just applying these learning paradigms out of the box. And a lot of the time, frequentism looks like you use extra data that's possibly synthesized. Um, Bayesian techniques often just reduce the computational load prescribed by the true Bayesian technique. And lastly, for evaluation, we talked about two things. Calibration, right? Can the model forecast its own performance? And coverage, does the model need the to meet the tolerated error level? And so I'll just leave you with some quick open problems. I mean, there's many, many open problems in this space, but some you might want to check out is one, just better methods for Bayesian computations, right? Over and over again, I mentioned how just we need better computational tools for dealing with Bayesian inference. That's still a very active research area. Uh, another active research area is how do we define guarantees or uncertainty quantification guarantees for deep learning models, right? Including like the big foundation models that are happening today, right? Like I'm sure OpenAI would pay you a lot of money if you had some good uncertainty quantification technique that you could apply in a lightweight way to chat GPT, right? This would be uh, very valuable, especially as these models are known to, you know, fabricate uh, at times. Um, another technique is, or another open problem is setting more informative Bayesian priors. And so right, Bayesian priors have this great ability to jumpstart your learning and learn a lot faster with less data than you need otherwise. But again, setting them for a big neural network is really hard to do because you have to specify them on the parameters and you don't necessarily know how that will translate to the sort of predictive functions that you get. Right, so it'd be great if, if we had a nice technique that said, okay, I, I know the model will should predict this in this type of case, this in this type of case, but in a very soft way that you could set that as a, just a very soft prior to guide the uh, predictive functions that you learn. Um, and lastly, because we're using, using machine learning in ever more and more complicated scenarios where you know you have a self-driving car where you have multiple correlated structured systems, doing uncertainty quantification in such systems is really important, right? You want to know how the outputs at one stage uh, affect the outputs downstream in another stage. And so doing uncertainty quantification is a technique that can reason about kind of the noise in both processes and how they're related is very important. Mm -hmm.
And so just if you want to see a sample of kind of what the research community is doing now, uh, there's some two recent, relatively recent workshops that will be of interest to you. Um, one happened at ICML 2021, Uncertainty and Robustness in Deep Learning. Um, and in 2022, there was the workshop on distribution-free uncertainty quantification, right? You can look up these uh, workshops on the internet and look at the papers they accepted. And this kind of gives you a, a good summary of, of the open problems that people are working on. Yeah, so thank you very much. I'll take some questions. <laughs>